Yo, what is going on, everyone? My name is Nick, or The Notorious Fantasy, and in today's video, I want to be going over my top 32 ranked wide receivers for week number two of the 2022 fantasy football season. But before we could get on into things, I would like to ask that if you guys are new to the channel and you do end up enjoying today's video, that you please make sure to hit that subscribe button down below. And while you're down there, whether you are new to the channel or not, please make sure that you do leave a like on today's video. It would help us out a ton. And if you do want to follow me on Twitter, please do so at NotoriousFNTSY. I would also like to make a quick note that the wide receivers that played on the Chargers and the Chiefs last night will not be in today's video because there's no reason to talk about them because now you can't just insert them into your lineup after they played. I'd also like to ask if you guys have any questions about fantasy football week number two, you ask down below in the comment section. I love talking to you guys down there. So without further ado, let's get into my week number two wide receiver rankings. We begin with wide receivers one through eight, headlined by Cooper Cup of the LA Rams, going up against the Atlanta Falcons this week at home in LA. Now, last week up against the Buffalo Bills, everything went wrong. Everything that could have possibly went against the Rams happened. Stafford struggled mightily, but even in a game where the LA Rams got absolutely fucking torched up against the Bills, Cooper Cup still had 15 targets, 13 receptions, 128 receiving yards, one touchdown, 25 half PPR fantasy points, and he was the wide receiver number two at the end of the week. So even in a tough matchup up against the Bills defense, even when Stafford looked atrocious, Cooper Cup was still putting up points. This week, they face the Atlanta Falcons, whose defense is as soft as baby shit. I fully expect Cooper Cup to go off this game, and he could easily be the number one wide receiver at the end of the week. Next up, we move to my number two wide receiver, who was the number one wide receiver last week, Justin Jefferson of the Minnesota Vikings, going up against the Philadelphia Eagles in Philadelphia on Monday Night Football, the second of two Monday Night Football games up against the Packers last week. Justin Jefferson had nine receptions on 11 targets for 184 receiving yards, two touchdowns, 35 half PPR points, and like I said, he was the number one wide receiver at the end of the week. Now, on paper, that matchup up against the Green Bay Packers should have been pretty difficult, but the Minnesota Vikings and Kirk Cousins just ripped them apart this week up against the Philadelphia Eagles, who got into a firefight, a back-and-forth Rock'em Sock'em Robots-esque match up against the Detroit Lions last week. I think Justin Jefferson is in for yet another humongous matchup. At number three, we got Devontae Adams of the Las Vegas Raiders going up against the Arizona Cardinals. Last week, up against the LA Chargers, he had 17 targets, 10 receptions, 141 receiving yards, one touchdown, 25 fantasy points, and he finished as the number three receiver at the end of the week. Now, last week, the fact that he got 17 targets, I don't really think that's going to happen up against the Arizona Cardinals. I could be wrong, but 17 targets is a crazy number. Even for a guy like Devontae Adams, who is that good. It seemed like Derek Carr was just force-feeding this guy the ball, and that interception that Derek Carr threw towards Devontae Adams should never have been thrown. Well, I guess unless it was Aaron Rodgers, because then Aaron Rodgers probably would have placed the ball better, but you get what I'm saying. Derek Carr should never have thrown that ball, but Devontae Adams was brought to the Raiders for a reason, and that was because he's an excellent wide receiver, one of the best in the league, and that Carr can get him the ball even when he's covered. Adams has the chance to come down with the ball up against the Arizona Cardinals, a team that was a disaster last week, a dumpster fire. I think this could be a very high scoring game. And obviously I like Devontae Adams. He's one of the better wide receivers in the league and this matchup screams points. So I definitely want to go ahead and have Devontae Adams in my starting lineup, but you already knew that before you even clicked on this video that you should play Adams. Next up, we move to Stefan Diggs of the Buffalo Bills going up against the Tennessee Titans on the first of two Monday night football games last week up against the Rams. Eight receptions on nine targets for 122 yards, one touchdown, 22 fantasy points, and sixth at the wide receiver position on the week. The Tennessee Titans were pretty decent against the pass last week, but that was going up against the Giants and Daniel Jones. Now they're going up against the Buffalo Bills. And we all know the Buffalo Bills are one of the best offenses in the NFL. Stephon Diggs is obviously an auto start every single week going forward. And we will see if this can truly be a 1A and 1B scenario with Diggs and Gabe Davis in this offense. I love Stephon Diggs here. I think the Buffalo Bills, regardless of how strong the defense is that they're going against, 
Doesn't really matter to me. Diggs is locked in as a top five wide receiver weekly. Next up, we move to a matchup between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Minnesota Vikings with A.J. Brown. Last week up against the Detroit Lions, A.J. Brown went off. The man got stung by a bee. He's allergic to bees a couple of days before the game. Didn't fucking matter at all. 13 targets, 10 receptions, 155 receiving yards, wide receiver 7 at the end of the week. This week up against the Minnesota Vikings, like I mentioned with Justin Jefferson, this game has all the makings of a very high scoring matchup. Now last week, Devontae Smith did his best John Cena impression because you could not see him. Devontae Smith got 4 targets I believe, didn't come down with a single ball, he was invisible. He was doing his best Houdini impression as well. Going up against the Minnesota Vikings, I project this to be a high-scoring back-and-forth affair. I think this game is tailored well for A.J. Brown to succeed, and it's very clear that even when the Eagles want to run the ball, every single fucking running back on the Eagles scored a touchdown. We saw Boston Scott find pay dirt. Same with Kenneth Gainwell and Miles Sanders, and still, A.J. Brown has a huge game, so even in this quote-unquote run-heavy offense of the Eagles, A.J. Brown can still get it done, and it makes sense. Just like with Devontae Adams, there's a reason why you trade the picks, you give the guy the big contract, because he is going to be a key piece in your offense. Next up, we move to wide receiver number six with Jamar Chase of the Cincinnati Bengals going up against the Dallas Cowboys this week in Jerry's World. 16 targets, 10 receptions, 129 yards, and a touchdown, finishing as the wide receiver number four up against the Steelers defense last week. Now, last week, Joe Shiesty and the Bengals struggled early on. It seemed like the Steelers had an answer for everything. TJ Watt was all over Joe Burrow's ass. Joe Burrow was throwing picks left and right. It seemed like a disaster scenario for the Cincinnati Bengals and both the Bengals and the Rams, who were just in the Super Bowl, both didn't play super hot on Sunday last week. Obviously, the Bengals started coming back. They came back in that game. But if the Steelers were a competent team, that game should have been over before it even started. With that said, though, even when Burrow struggled, Chase was still able to light it up. Now, T. Higgins did get banged up very early on in that game with a concussion, so he did miss a majority of the game. So maybe that elevates Chase slightly. T. Higgins should be back this week up against Dallas, but I still like Jamar Chase a ton. Again, these guys inside of the top eight, there's a reason why he drafted him so highly, because you want to play him every week. And this does seem like a pretty solid matchup up against the Cowboys. I know they kept the Bucks in check a little bit last week, but the Bucs weren't really trying to pass the ball. They were kind of just handing the ball off and just easily winning the game. I think this game, uh, the Cincinnati Bengals will be looking to throw a lot more than the Bucs did. Next up, we move to wide receiver number seven, Debo Samuel of the San Francisco 49ers going up against the Seattle Seahawks. Now, last week, Debo Samuel was a disaster, but I'm not going to blame him for that game because there was a torrential downpour. I've talked about this in all of the videos, so if you've watched all the videos throughout the week, you're probably tired of hearing me say the same shit, but the reason why I don't want to harp too much on that game is because the weather was insane. The fact that he only had two receptions on seven targets from Trey Lance seems very unlikely to happen this week. He did score a touchdown, scoring 12 fantasy points, so it wasn't very good at all, but the touchdown really bailed you out. This week up against Seattle, the weather appears to be fine. There's going to be no torrential downpour, and you want to play Debo Samuel every single week. We did see him get eight rushing opportunities last week. Could that be because of the fact that it was raining? Maybe, maybe not, but I do still think that Debo Samuel is going to be seeing a decent amount of rushing opportunities week in and week out, and I definitely love him up against the Seattle defense this week as my wide receiver number seven. Closing out the top eight, we move to Michael Pittman Jr. of the Indianapolis Colts this week, facing up against the Jacksonville. Jaguars in Jacksonville. Now, last week up against the Houston Texans in a cupcake matchup, Michael Pittman paid off easily. 13 targets, nine receptions, 121 receiving yards, one touchdown, wide receiver number five at the end of the week. Now, Michael Pittman is dealing with an injury right now. He is dealing with a quad injury, and he did not participate in practice yesterday on Thursday. So this is something important to monitor. If Michael Pittman does not end up playing, then obviously you don't want to play Pittman. But if Pittman gets the nod, 
I think even a hobbled version of Michael Pittman is a start-worthy wide receiver. And again, we don't know everything about the injury right now and the severity of it. I feel like we'll know a lot more maybe later today going into Sunday. But if Michael Pittman plays, this matchup is far too good to leave him on your bench. Now we move to wide receivers. 9 through 16 headlined by Tyreek the Freak Hill of the Miami Dolphins going up against the Baltimore Ravens in Baltimore this week. Now week 1 up against the Patriots defense. Tyreek Hill had 8 receptions on 12 targets. 94 receiving yards. No touchdowns. But he did get 1 rush for 6 yards. Finishing as the wide receiver 21 on the week and half PPR. Nothing special for Tyreek Hill. But that was a very vanilla game for the Dolphins against the Patriots. The Patriots looked like they had no answer for the Dolphins' defense. The Dolphins' defense destroyed Mac Jones. There was even a play in the game where one of the Dolphins' defenders went low, the other guy went high on Mac Jones, and they basically cut the motherfucker in half. It was crazy. The Patriots were nowhere near in that game, so I think that's why we didn't really see Tua do anything crazy. If there is no worry about losing the game, Tua isn't the kind of quarterback that's just like, fuck it, let me make this crazy decision. He's more of a game manager. He's trying to keep things so that they don't lose the game. So he didn't have to chuck a crazy ball to Tyreek. Now, he actually did at one point in the game where probably could have been a pick. He throws it to Tyreek. There's a guy blank blanket covering him, and Tyreek jumps up with one hand, Odell style, and snags the thing away from the defender who has two hands on the ball. Tyreek Hill is extremely talented. This week up against Baltimore, this is a tougher matchup, but the the Baltimore Ravens are dealing with a lot of injuries defensively, and I think since the Baltimore offense is actually good, this will be a back-and-forth type of a game, which could elevate Tyreek Hill and this offense to be pushing the ball further down the field, to be taking those shots on Tyreek Hill. He's a guy I want to be starting every single week, and I think week number one was just the beginning for what could be an excellent year out of Tyreek Hill. Next up, we move to wide receiver number 10, Hollywood Brown of the Arizona Cardinals, facing up against the Las Vegas Raiders in Las Vegas this week. Now, the Arizona Cardinals put up a stinker of a matchup up against the Chiefs last week. I thought that was going to be a very back-and-forth type of game there, and it ended up being very one-sided as the Kansas City Chiefs Cleveland steamered the Arizona Cardinals. In that game, Hollywood Brown scored a touchdown at the end of the game, which was kind of the savior of the day, right? The saver of the day. Six targets, four receptions, 43 yards, a tug, 12 fantasy points, Nothing special, but this week up against Las Vegas, again, the narrative is going to be this is a high-scoring game. Now, we all know the negative narrative towards Kyler Murray when Call of Duty comes out that Kyler plays worse. Now, a note to make, the Modern Warfare 2 beta comes out this weekend. So maybe we should be a little bit worried about the short King Kyler Murray at the end of the day, though. I do see that more of as a joke. It's not real, right? It's not like he's actually much worse. It's more the fact that when Call of Duty comes out, it's typically around the time when Cliff Kingsbury just sucks ass at coaching. So Hollywood Brown should be perfectly fine this weekend, and I expect him to finish as a top 10 wideout. Next up, we move to number 11, Gabriel Davis of the Buffalo Bills going up against the Tennessee Titans this week. Gabe Davis definitely paid off in week number one. Five targets, four receptions, 88 yards, one tug, wide receiver 12 at the end of the week. Again, Gabe Davis is definitely a must-start kind of a player. You saw the burst that this man has. You saw that game up against Kansas City last year in the playoffs. This guy is a real deal talent. And if the defense focuses in on Diggs, if Diggs has a bad game, Gabe Davis might go absolutely fucking nuclear for fantasy football. Definitely a guy that I view very highly and certainly should be able to finish as a top 12 wideout at the end of the week. Next up, we move to Michael Thomas of the New Orleans Saints going up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, I know a lot of people have Michael Thomas conservatively ranked as like wide receiver 18 right now based upon expert consensus on fantasy pros. Michael Thomas is wide receiver 23. Now, I'm ranking him this high because I think he has the ability to be a top 10 receiver every single week. He was wide receiver eight last week up against the Falcons. Now I understand the Falcons defense is much softer than the Bucks defense up against Atlanta in Atlanta, eight targets, five receptions, 57 receiving yards, two tugs, wide receiver, eight fantasy points. He scored 20 in that game and half PPR. I know the Bucks defense is a little bit tougher, but over the last couple of years, the Bucks defense hasn't been the greatest at stopping New Orleans, and New Orleans has dominated the Bucks over the last couple of years 
in the regular season. Michael Thomas is one of the best wide receivers in the league. I know there was worries going into last week. I was worried about Michael Thomas because I stated that this motherfucker is either going to go out there and score like four points or he's going to score 25 points. He scored 20 points, so I was pretty right on that. He's definitely a little bit more risky, but again, I'm not playing super safe in fantasy football. I'm trying to win my week. I'm not trying to make it so, ooh, maybe I could win by two points. I'm trying to smack the ever-living shit out of my opponent like I'm Will Smith. So I'm going to go ahead and go with Michael Thomas here, wide receiver of the Saints, wide receiver number 12 for me. Next up, we move to wide receiver Amon Ra, St. Brown of the Detroit Lions, going up against the Washington Commanders this week at home in Detroit. Last week at home, up against the Eagles, eight receptions, 12 targets, 64 receiving yards, one touchdown, wide receiver 14 at the end of the week. Up against the Washington Commanders, the Commanders looked pretty solid last week up against Jacksonville. This is a game that Vegas has right now as the second highest point total projected on the week, so I'm very excited to see what Amon Ra St. Brown can do up against the Washington commanders the commander secondary isn't the best so i think amon ross st brown certainly has the upside to be a top 10 wide receiver this week and i assume this is going to be a back and forth affair and jared goff looks pretty decent and right now i am personally under the assumption that we do see mr deandre swift play for the lions and if swift doesn't play Maybe they look to use Amon Ra St. Brown even more in this matchup up against the Commanders. Next up, we move to Mr. T. Higgins, Titty Boy Higgins of the Cincinnati Bengals going up against the Dallas Cowboys. Right now, I am much higher than the expert consensus rankings because I have him at wide receiver 14. Expert consensus has him at wide receiver 33. But I don't care because I assume those rankings aren't assuming T. Higgins is going to play. Right now, everything that I have seen says that he's progressing well and is going to be good to go on Sunday. I don't give a fuck if he doesn't practice all week. That doesn't mean anything when you are as skilled as T. Higgins. T. Higgins got knocked out early on in that game. Two targets, two receptions, 27 yards, four fantasy points. But what do you expect if the guy misses a majority of the game? I didn't expect him to have put up a crazy point total, especially early on when the Bengals were struggling mightily, right? Like the Bengals looked like Joe Burrow literally looked like fucking Ray Charles in the pocket. It was actually embarrassing. So I think this week T. Higgins bounces back and could finish as a top 12 wide receiver. This is just an offense that you want to have a part you want to be a part of in fantasy football so I definitely think Higgins is in for a quote-unquote bounce back game but it's not really a bounce back because he barely even played last week and again I'm assuming he plays based upon everything that I've read I assume he's gonna play now again I'm not a doctor I say this all the time as much I'm as much of a doctor as Johnny Sins is but hey, everything I've read seems very positive on Higgins. Next up, we move to Cortland Sutton of the Denver Broncos going up against the Houston Texans. Now, last week, it was kind of strange that Sutton only had four receptions on seven targets for 72 yards. He sucked absolute donkey cock compared to what I expected him to do. But this week, he goes up against the Texans. That defense isn't very good at all. I still believe Cortland Sutton is the number one receiver on the team. If you want to rank Judy ahead of him, Go ahead. I have Judy lower in the rankings, but I'm not going to judge you if you think Judy's better than Sutton. That is perfectly okay with me. I'm still under the assumption, though, that Denver Broncos wide receiver Sutton is the number one guy instead of Judy. I think up against the Texans, the Russell Wilson-led Denver Broncos get things right here. And hey, maybe if Nathaniel Hackett decides to maybe throw the ball instead of being an absolute fucking pussy and trying to kick the field goal, then maybe Colin Sutton gets another reception and he finishes with over 10 points. So I think Sutton is bouncing back big in week number two. Next up, we move to DJ Moore, wiki wiki, of the Carolina Panthers going up against the Giants in MetLife. Last week up against the Cleveland Browns, DJ Moore shit the bed compared to what I thought he was going to end up doing. Six targets, three receptions, 43 receiving yards. He also had a rush for seven yards, finishing as the wide receiver number 55. Now, you didn't draft DJ Moore where you drafted him because DJ Moore is going to score you seven fucking fantasy points. I'll tell you that much. DJ Moore seems like this is the best scenario for him in a while because his quarterback will actually throw the ball. Now, last week... Carolina Panthers, it seemed like, at least in my opinion, that Baker Mayfield made this revenge game out to be bigger than it was. Like, in Baker's head, this is like the Super Bowl for him. Like, I have to beat the Browns, and then he's making stupid decisions because the, he made the game too big for himself. He thought to, like, it made him worried, I think. I think that's what happened. Now, again, I'm not a psychologist or whatever the fuck you call it, where you can try to figure out what someone's thinking. I don't even know if that is an actual profession. It definitely isn't. But I'm not like some someone who knows exactly what Baker was thinking. 
But what I do know is it seemed like something was off. Like, it seemed like he was trying too hard almost, and that fucked him over. So I think DJ Moore bounces back this week, as do I believe Baker Mayfield bounces back. And I don't think the Giants' defense is as good as they looked last week up against the Le Titans. So next up, we move to Jalen Waddle to way, Waddle Waddle, till the very next day. Bum, 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 bum. Wide receiver, numero 17. So now we're into wide receiver 17 through 24. When it comes to Jalen Waddle, Last week, at the beginning of the game, I started to worry because Jalen Waddle was not doing too much at the beginning of the game. It was run the ball, throw the ball to Tyreek, or uh, you're kind of shit out of luck. And then Waddle on fourth and seven makes that cut skirt in between three DBs. Ball's thrown, or I think there was a safety there, so two DBs and a safety. Throws the ball to him, catches that shit, takes it to the crib. Five targets, four receptions, 69 yards. Very nice. I like. One rush, eight rushing yards, one touchdown, wide receiver, 15. But this week, I don't think he's going to need that touchdown in order to be useful. I think they're going to be in a firefight up against Baltimore. I think this is going to be a close game. I think this is going to be a game where the offense can't kind of just pussyfoot their way around. I think they're going to need to try to step on the gas here, and I think that could help out Jalen Waddle as well as Tyreek. Pretty confident Jalen Waddle and Tyreek can both succeed in this offense, so Tyreek is my wide receiver. Number 17, at 18, we move to Monsieur Brandon Cooks of the Houston Texans going up against the Denver Broncos this week. Now, Brandon Cooks every single week is just one of the safest options to throw into your lineup. I feel like Brandon Cooks is never going to have that number one fantasy football game, right? He's never going to elevate himself and pro- probably because he's on the Texans to becoming like this weak winning wide receiver where he himself, even if a couple of your guys don't do too, too hot, that he himself can put the team on his back and take you to the promised land. But he also is never really going to screw you over. He's just going to be pretty decent, finish in the range of like wide receiver 12 through 24 on a bad game. He'll be like wide receiver 30 and you'll be just all right with Brandon Cooks. 12 targets last week, 7 receptions up against Indy, 82 receiving yards, 12 fantasy points, wide receiver 27. Nothing special, but he still saw 12 targets, almost had 100 yards. Brandon Cooks is a shoo-in to get 1,000 yards on the season. He's incredibly safe every single week up against the Denver Broncos. If the Broncos are scoring a bunch of points, then guess what? The Texans are going to have to throw the ball, and that will help out Brandon Cooks a ton. I think Brandon Cooks is an incredibly safe wide receiver every single week going forward. Next up, we move to Mike Evans. Now, Mike Evans is ranked incredibly low, and if I'm being honest with you, Jerry Judy, Christian Kirk, Adam Thielen, Deontay Johnson... Terry McLaurin, these guys I have ranked below Mike Evans, you might want to start them ahead of Evans. Now, the reason why Evans is wide receiver number 19 is because I will look like an absolute idiot if Evans doesn't get Lattimore like normal. Mike Evans struggles immensely against Marshawn Lattimore, and that's no secret. That's not a secret at all. Everyone knows that. But Mike Evans is so good they really don't have, without Godwin, like you have to think Brady wants to force the ball to Evans. Now I understand Julio hopped in the time machine, looks pretty good. But I think from a sheer volume standpoint, Evans should get the volume. And this isn't a primetime game. This is just in New Orleans at 1 p.m. on Sunday. So I think Evans could still get it done, but I'm definitely very worried. And if you want to play things safe, then guys like McLaurin, Johnson, Judy, Kirk, Thielen just seem like safer bets to me. Again, that doesn't mean I don't like Mike Evans this week. He played pretty good up against Dallas last week. Seven targets, five receptions, 71 receiving yards, uh, 16 fantasy points, wide receiver 16 on the week. He made a phenomenal touchdown snag in that game against Diggs. Diggs stood no chance. He was looking at, at Evans. Evans is doing some crazy fucking gymnastics, catches the ball. It's amazing. Mike Evans is immensely talented. So that's why he's wide receiver 19. But the matchup? Doesn't seem ideal, at least in my opinion. Next up, we move to wide receiver F1. Scary. Terry McLaurin of the Washington football team. Four targets, two receptions, 58 receiving yards, one touchdown, 13 fantasy points, 25 uh, wide receiver 25 at the end of the week up against Jacksonville. Four targets. That's not great for McLaurin. But do you really expect Dotson and Curtis Samuel to both tag team the Detroit Lions defense like they did to Jacksonville last week? Honestly, I don't think so. I think Terry McLaurin is still a guy you can rely on. One bad week, especially in week number one, I'm never too worried about. Week number one, a lot of these teams, they don't really have the starters playing together in preseason. 
This is really the first time you see them working together for a serious amount of time. So sure, it might take some time to develop a connection with Wentz and McLaurin, but at the end of the day, McLaurin is so fucking good that you shouldn't panic at all. Don't worry about McLaurin. Don't just trade him away for a fucking half-eaten taquito or something. Just don't panic. Hold Mr. Terry McLaurin because the upside of McLaurin is very, very high considering how skilled of a player he is. Plus, Wentz actually looked pretty good, so... Maybe that'll help out McLaurin even more. But before we get on into the next wide receiver, wide receiver number 21, Deontay Johnson, I would like to give you guys a quick word from our friends and our sponsor over at Underdog Fantasy. Are your best ball teams already cooked? Head on over to Underdog Fantasy to resurrect them with their week number six through week 17 best ball tournament. The entry fee is just $10. With $500,000 in prizes, $100,000 to first place, all you got to do is draft your team on Underdog Fantasy. That's best ball. That's it. You don't have to worry about trading, no in-season management, no waivers. Underdog will automatically give you your best score at the end of each and every single week. They also offer daily contests and best ball contests in MLB, NBA, PGA, and NHL. So, it's not just NFL. You can get action all season long or all year long, I should say. And all you got to do is click on the link in the video description down below or use promo code STOCHASTIC. It's been on your screen this whole time. S-T-O-K-A-S-T-I-C to get a first match deposit bonus of up to $100 with Underdog. So you want to do this best ball resurrection contest because you love drafting just like I do. I love drafting. Then if you use promo code STOCHASTIC, you will get 10 free entries into that. So 20 entries for the price of 10 Sounds like a good deal to me, so make sure you guys do go ahead and head on over to Underdog Fantasy. Next up, we got Mr. Deontay Johnson of the Steelers going up against the Patriots at home in not Heinz Field anymore, whatever the name of the new stadium is in Pittsburgh. Last week up against Cincy, he did get a lot of targets, 12 targets, 7 receptions, 55 yards, no touchdown, wide receiver, 40 and half PPR, 9 fantasy football points. Not great, not bad. Um, Trubisky didn't look great, but maybe it's just the week one jitters. I think Trubisky is actually pretty decent. The New England defense didn't look very good up against the Dolphins. Now, they might look a little bit better up against the Steelers offense, but Deontay Johnson is still clearly the number one option on this team. With Najee Harris banged up, I don't think they heavily look to get Najee involved, which could mean more targets for Deontay Johnson. Not the greatest start you want to see for Deontay Johnson, considering I was a big Deontay Johnson guy all offseason, but I'm not super disappointed. I'm not going to get worried. Just start him this week, wide receiver 21. At number 22, we got Jerry Judy of the Broncos going up against the Texans. Again, if you want to flip Judy and Sutton in the rankings, go right ahead. I had wide receiver 15, I believe, for Cortland Sutton. Fine if you want to move Judy up there. Judy is definitely a guy I want in my lineups as well. Last week up against Seattle, four receptions, seven targets, 102 receiving yards, a tug. Wide receiver 11 at the end of the week. This week up against Houston is a very incredibly easy matchup for Jerry Judy. I expect him to succeed. I think he's a very safe option with a whole lot of upside. Again, Daniel Hackett kind of threw that game away. I think Russell Wilson also might have been a little bit in his head, but Russell Wilson played good. It's just the fact that the team fumbled on the goal line twice. Like, you can't get to the basic goal, basically the goal line four times, and all you get from that is a field goal. Not a good look. So I think Jerry Judy, though, and this whole team of week number two will be bouncing back. Next up, we move to, to Mr. Christian Kirk of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Last week up against Washington, Christian Kirk was a target hog. 12 targets, 6 receptions, 117 yards, wide receiver number 19. This is kind of what I expected out of Christian Kirk. He's not the most talented player on earth, but he's going to see a lot of targets. If he finds the end zone, he could be a top 10 receiver every week. If he doesn't, then he's a pretty safe wide receiver too. Again, wide receiver 23 in my rankings, finishes wide receiver 19 last week. Wouldn't be surprised if he finishes wide receiver 19 again. T-Law, Mr. Trevor Lawrence, loves throwing him the fucking ball. So he's just going to continue to get fed. Again, I don't really ever project him to go crazy, especially against the Indianapolis defense. Like his next upcoming schedule is pretty tough. Like he's got Indy this week, pretty difficult. Then the Chargers. I know the Chiefs offense looked decent against that, but they dropped a bunch of picks. Uh, his next best game is against the Eagles in week four. But again, I'm still starting him in all those games. I'm just not expecting him to go off and win me my week. Next up, we move to Adam Thielen, who was awful last week. Let's just be honest with you. Let's just not sugarcoat things. Four receptions, three targets. Again, it's not, he, was, he wasn't necessarily awful. I'll take that back. I don't want to be a dick to Adam Thielen. I like Adam Thielen. But he wasn't given enough volume, so he wasn't productive. 
four targets, three receptions, 36 yards, five fantasy points, wide receiver 64. But Kirk Cousins really just funneled the ball to Justin Jefferson. Dalvin Cook didn't have a great game. I talked about that in my running back rankings video, which you should also watch. And make sure you hit that like button and that subscribe button on today's video. It really does help me out a ton. And if you have any questions, make sure you leave them in the comment section. But Adam Thielen could have been better. But Kirk Cousins was just feeding the ball to Jefferson. I don't think that's going to be the game plan every single game. I think Justin Jefferson was just open, so Kirk threw it to him. I think this week, up against the Eagles, we see a heavier dosage of Thielen. And remember, guys, last year, Thielen scored the same amount of touchdowns as Justin Jefferson while playing in less games. So I think that Adam Thielen is still a start-worthy wide receiver, and I'm not hopping off the bandwagon just because of one bad game. Next up, we move to Rashad Master Bateman of the Baltimore Ravens going up against the Miami Dolphins. Now, this game could go one or two ways for Rashad Master Bateman. It could be a disaster because Xavier Howard is shadowing him. Xavier Howard locked up everyone that he was guarding last week. I think he got thrown to one time, and that was the time where they threw it to Parker. X hit it up in the air like a fucking assist. Holland catches it. Safety. Not a safety. A fucking interception is what I meant to say in the end zone. It was great. So teams know not to throw towards Xavier Howard. If Miami puts X on Rashad Bateman, Rashad Bateman is going to be awful. But there's also a chance that X doesn't view Bateman as, or the team doesn't view Bateman as the alpha, as the guy to shadow. So maybe X goes from Bateman to Duvernay to James Brochet, or maybe they put him on Mark Andrews. I don't think that's going to happen, but maybe they do. So I don't necessarily think it's a mortal lock of the century. Bet your fucking life that X shadows Bateman. So Bateman's wide receiver 25. Last week, he kind of disappointed. Uh, he was wide receiver 24, 13 fantasy points, five targets, two receptions, 59 yards, one touchdown. But again, Lamar and this team didn't really have to do anything. They didn't have much of a fight back from the Jets. The Jets were kind of just there getting the ever-living shit beat out of them for 60 minutes, and they leave. That's what it was. So it's not like they had to pepper Bateman, try to move the ball up the field. Whereas I think up against the Dolphins is going to be a much closer game to where both teams are throwing the ball more. So I think Bateman will be just fine. Again, nothing special this week due to the matchup. But I think in week number three up against New England, Bateman might be able to go absolutely crazy. Next up, we move to my guy Darnell. Here comes the Mooney. Mooney, 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 Mooney of the Bears going up against Green Bay on Sunday Night Football in Lambeau Field. Last week, again, throw the stats out the window. Three targets, one reception, eight yards in that crazy weather game up against Green Bay. Moody's going to get the ball because Justin Fields will actually be able to throw the ball. Darnell Mooney is a volume play. He's a sheer volume play because the team barely has anyone to throw the ball to besides Mooney and Komet. The reason why you start Mooney is not because he's this crazy, amazing wide receiver he is pretty good, but I don't think he's, like, amazing. You play him because he's just going to get so many targets, and even if the matchup is tough, which does kind of worry me, the fact that he gets so many targets kind of negates that. So, Darnell Mooney, wide receiver 26. I think he's an all-right start this week at 27. We got Hunter Renfro going up against the Arizona Cardinals. Last week, Renfro definitely disappointed. Six targets, three receptions, 21 receiving yards, four fantasy points, wide receiver 78. But again, just like we talked about with Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen, Devontae Adams was getting peppered with targets, Salt Bay style, just dumping him with targets. And then Hunter Renfro is just kind of chilling there. Darren Waller didn't have all that great of a game either. I think up against Arizona here, this is going to be a firefight. And I think Renfro gets a lot more involved in the game plan this week. Last week didn't go his way. But again, with these wide receivers that we liked in the offseason, there's no reason to run away from them in week number two. Though, if he doesn't play too hot in week number two, then uh, maybe then it's time to panic. Speaking of panic, wide receiver 28th, Allen Robinson. Yikes. Allen Robinson. Two targets against Buffalo, one reception, 12 yards, two fantasy points. Was it even a top 100 wide receiver, and I was all in favor of Allen Robinson last week, and I was all banging the drum for him all offseason. Now, this is a scenario where either Darnell, not Darnell Mooney, either Al, I was thinking about the Bears, Darnell Mooney, Allen Robinson used to be a Bear, so e either Al Robinson was just bad, and that's why he wasn't good last year for the Bears, or Matt Nagy's an idiot, Robinson has one bad game, and then Robinson is that guy. So I'm not 
running away from Robinson yet. I know it might feel risky, but this matchup up against Atlanta is mouth-watering. This is a game where you want to have players on the Rams in your lineup. I fully expect, fully expect Robinson to have a big bounce-back spot here up against the Atlanta Falcons. 29, we got CeeDee Lamb. Now, again, I'm not panicking. I am panicking, but I'm not jumping off ship yet. I'm not trading CD Lamb for a used condom here for half-eaten bag of potato chips. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. And I'm also not going to trade for CD Lamb because it's you're never going to get the correct value if you try to trade for him or trade away from him or trade away him. So Lamb, 11 targets, two receptions, 29 yards up against Tampa Bay. Dak is now gone for at least the next couple of weeks. Now, I know the Cowboys are very hopeful. Dak's going to come back. I don't know when Dak's coming back. Their bye week is week nine. I would say if Dak isn't back by week 10 against Green Bay, then everything has went drastically wrong. Cooper Rush could force feed the ball to CeeDee Lamb. I will say that that is definitely a possibility, but I don't think that is a lock of the century for that to happen. The problem here is if Dak was playing this week, I could have just spun a narrative around my head, mental gymnastics. So what does it matter? CD has one bad game. He got 11 targets. He'll be fine. Dak's, Dak's good. Like, one bad game. But it, the fact is that it's Rush. That has me uh, very worried. Let me know what you guys think about Lamb in the comments. Seems like not everyone's uh, loving starting Lamb this week. Jarvis Landry, my guy. Even in New Orleans with Olave and Michael Thomas, Landry somehow is still a target hog. Honestly, it's kind of impressive. Nine targets, seven receptions, 114 yards, zero touchdowns, 15 fantasy points, wide receiver 18 against Atlanta in Atlanta. Up against Tampa Bay is definitely a tougher matchup, but if Jarvis Landry continues to just be throwing the ball all the time, then you're going to want to play him. I also, again, am all aboard the narrative that the New Orleans Saints play really good up against the Bucs. I think Jarvis will have a fine day. 31, we got DK Metcalf of the Seattle Seahawks. Last week, seven targets, seven receptions, 36 yards, uh, five fantasy points. Gino looked good, but I think the reason why Gino looked good, talked about this in the wide receiver starts hit videos, because the beginning of the game is scripted. Now, I'm not saying that it's scripted like Roger Goodell writes the script. I'm saying like that the team scripts the plays they're going to be running. They know what they're going to do for like the first 15 minutes of the game. Then after that, there's no script. Now you have to actually think. Pete Carroll's got to figure shit out. And once it became Pete Carroll figure shit out, the Seahawks started to fall more and more off. But with that said, Gino was still throwing the rock at a high rate to Metcalf. So even though I don't like the team Metcalf's on, even though I think Gino Smith is an absolute, I don't think he's good. I think that was a very lucky game uh, for Gino Smith. I think he's a fraud. But I think Metcalf is still startable. Uh, if he scores a touchdown, he'll be pretty decent. But I don't really see him finishing inside of like the top 12. He's just an all right play. Uh, not a guy I drafted on any of my teams. Uh, final player here, Devontae Smith with the goose egg last week up against the Lions. Four targets for no receptions. Uh, zero fantasy points. Wide receiver 119. Going up against the Vikings this week. I think Smith catches at least a couple of balls in this game. The team does look to want to throw the ball more. So I think Smith will be fine going forward. But he is definitely a very hit or miss wide receiver. Like if A.J. Brown takes the Minnesota Vikings out back to pound town, then I would be a little bit worried about Devontae Smith going forward. So thank you guys all so much for watching today's video. If you did end up enjoying, make sure that you hit that like button down below as well as that subscribe button. It helps me out a ton. Make sure to check out Underdog Fantasy promo code Stochastic for that $100 first match deposit bonus. And if you want to, follow me on Twitter at NotoriousFNTSY. I love all you guys so much. I hope you have a great rest of your guys' day. And as always, good boy!